That's what grace teaches. Grace does not teach that you're cloaked in His righteousness and you're filthy to the core. If you think you're going to present filthy rags to God, try presenting filthy rags to your spouse if you want to retain your marriage. See, it's foolishness to think, even think so. That you just say, well, everything you try to do to please me, wife, is just filthy rags. You're just trying to gain my, my uh, approval. Isn't that exactly what these preachers are saying? It is. It is. If you want to retain your marriage, you don't go out and commit adultery and run around and do all kinds of lewd things on your spouse. No. You remain faithful and pure to that relationship. But I imagine a lot of people don't understand that because marriage is in shambles because of the way these guys preach. But that's certainly the covenant of marriage was intended to be pure and holy devotion to one another, just like our devotion to Christ. See, many people today that are going to tell you that they're building on this most holy foundation and that anybody uh, that says otherwise that substitution and man's inability, they're just puffed up with knowledge. But yet in reality, who has knowledge of the truth? Whose eyes are really illuminated to these things? Like the scripture says in Hebrews 6, 4 and 10, 32 about illumination or enlightenment, same word. See, in the scriptures, there are two kind of knowledge expressed. See, one is the basic knowledge and understanding of something. G-N-O-S-I-S, -S, gnosis, gnosis, Romans 1, 19. This is the this is the knowledge they they knew they knew God. He revealed it to them in, in that they what is may be known of God is manifest to them, for God has shown it to them. That's just the basic word for knowledge. In other words, God reveals himself in his creation. It's clearly seen, Romans 1 20, 1 19 and 20. So man is without excuse that he rejects this knowledge and then follows his futile thoughts and becomes foolish and darkened in his heart, as it goes on to say. But the other type of knowledge, so I think this is so important for you to grasp, the other type of knowledge is expressed in Scripture, and I can't, I didn't memorize how to pronounce it in the Greek, but it's expressed in Scripture as a precise and correct knowledge of the truth. Look that up. Start in Hebrews 10.26 if you sin against your knowledge of the truth. That means a precise and correct knowledge, and you'll see all the other Scriptures that use that. This is the knowledge that God desires all men to attain, beginning in repentance, lest they perish. In 1 Timothy 2.4, come to a knowledge of the truth. He wishes that none perish, they repent and come to a knowledge. Of, that's what he's talking about, a precise and correct knowledge of the truth. Not a knowledge mixed with all kinds of error that these men teach about this magic cover and substitution stuff. That's what he's talking about. Free from any mixture of error. Because why? If you sin against this precise, incorrect knowledge of the truth. Hebrews 10.26. I know the pundits used to always try to say, well, that meant just you, you knew the truth, but you really weren't in the truth. No, it exactly means that you were in the truth. That's how it's used throughout the rest of Scripture. They're liars and they're deceivers. And that's why they said those kind of things. So if you sin against that, you're going to descend into a reprobate mind, like Romans 1.21 says. Although they knew God, full and complete knowledge. They knew God, that's that word there. They did not glorify Him as God. They didn't build on His solid foundation, depart from iniquity. They exchanged His truth for a lie. They suppressed the truth in unrighteousness. And what did they do? They served, they worshipped, and they served an image that they created in their own minds, their vain imaginations, an image of human inability, of faith alone and substitution and moral transfer of Christ's virtue and a magic cover for their sins. That's their imaginations that they've created for the last 1,500 years. That's why they're going to force their doctrines and their theologies to blend with the scriptures in their commentaries and in their books, their sermons and their lectures. They twist this stuff to bring people into the, their own way of thinking, all it is is the error of the wicked that Peter warned about. 
That's what happens to that's what happens to these people. See, that's what that's that's the reason you got to come to the unity of the faith, into the knowledge of the Son of God, in the perfect man, in the measure and the stature and the fullness of Christ. That's the reason that ministry was given to us, as one brother points out in Ephesians chapter four, that the apostles and the teachers and the shepherds and all the evangelists they are br they are bringing people perfecting the saints to this knowledge of the truth, beginning in that repentance, that full departure from sin. That's where it starts, on the solid foundation, 2 Timothy 2.19, departure from iniquity. That's where it starts, to the perfect man. See, they're so afraid of that word perfect today, they accuse us of all kinds of things for just saying it. But that's what the scripture says. The man that is walking upright, that's doing what's right by faith, working by love, purifying his heart of sin. See, that's why the professing churches, as I pointed out right at the outset, are filled with piles of filthy and stinking filthy rags, They're always learning but never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. 2 Timothy 3, 7, right? Which, which knowledge is that? The precise, incorrect knowledge of the truth. They can never arrive at it. I've been in the churches. I spent many years trying to wake those people up and find a pastor that loved the truth instead of loving the lie. All to no, to, to no avail. Because they never come to a precise and correct knowledge of the truth free from all these errors and tell the people to stand on that solid foundation of His truth. They might know God. They know of Him but they know nothing about his solid foundation. That's the point here. That's the importance of gaining this knowledge. Because it, it, is, it is the basis, the pivot point of all truth. Through it then, like in 2 Peter chapter 1. Let's look at that. You read that uh, first 11 verses in, in that chapter. Through that, then, you can attain and access the exceeding great and precious promises through which you can partake of the divine nature and escape the corruption that's in the world through lust. Isn't that the promise there? Through this knowledge, as he says, his divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge, precise and correct knowledge of him that we gained in that repentance. We began it. That's where we began of him who called us by glory and virtue, in which he has given us the exceeding great and precious promises, and that through these we might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped. See, he's saying you already escaped if you did this. Not you're going to someday. Having escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust. But because of this, you add to your faith. We'll, we'll get to that part. We'll get to that part. So in this knowledge, then, you can no longer be unfruitful in the knowledge of Christ, as it goes on to say. Your entrance, then, into the kingdom will be assured to you abundantly in the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, as it goes on down to verse 11. This is why the, you've got to understand at the beginning what it says in the very next verse, in verse 5, to add to your faith, to make your calling and election sure. Otherwise, you'll be given over to blindness and dullness of heart, thinking that Christ did it all for you. And you don't have to put forth any effort yourself to do it. You have to put forth every effort. What's he say? He says, but for this very reason, that we, we've, we've got this knowledge through our repentance, we can be partakers of the divine nature, we can have all things that pertain to godliness, but for this reason, be even more diligent giving all diligence to add to your faith. And if you fail to do those things, you're being taught that you can't do those things in the church. Many people outside the church, outside the system, are teaching people they're not able to do these things unless some magic happens to them. You put forth the effort in Christ. See, the extreme danger, and we get into Second Peter, second chapter of Second Peter, in verse 20, 18 through 20, that the person who did escape the pollutions and the lusts of the world through this knowledge 
Then he gets entangled in the lies and the presumptions of men, and he returns to his former vomit. Fortunately, I've seen it happen. It's, it's not nice, not very, not very pleasant to see, very discouraging. See, they always end up worse off than before, just like that scripture says. Although I, I understand that few people today ever depart from their iniquity to begin with. So that's not what Peter's talking about. He's talking about people that have escaped. I know it says clean escaped in the King James Version, but they have escaped indeed is the expression here. So these people have truly escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust. But I know few today do that. But the, the few that do escape these lies, and then down the road... They fall prey to the error of the wicked, and they're taken captive by some slip-talking preacher that claims uh, to be hearing from God, like he talks about there in three, 2 Peter 3.17, the error of the wicked. They, they usually begin then by attacking the foundation of Christ's doctrines, suggesting that man lacks a free and unhindered ability to depart from iniquity to begin with. So you don't have that full departure of sin in repentance. You have it happening afterwards. Implying that a man must first be saved in his sins because he's unable to do that. He's unable because of his sinful nature, his corrupted nature. He, he's the nature, got the Adamic nature of Adam. That has to be regenerated first before he's able to depart. That's not the Scriptures. The Scriptures are speaking, for the most part, the prophets, like Isaiah chapter 1, Come, let us reason together, saith the Lord. He's speaking to what? Scarlet sinners. What's he say the very next 